Hello, hello. There we go. There we go. There we go. What's up, family? Welcome to Working Sunday. My name is Ruben Lee, and my dirty little secret is that growing up, I wanted to be Mark Echo. Younger audiences, you might think that's crazy because now Echo is basically just like a Macy's sale brand. But in the 90s, Mark Echo was one of the first people to take original graffiti art, put it on t-shirts, and mass market them. It was fresh. And as a graffiti artist and aspiring businessman, I thought, hey, I could do that. So I bought myself a t-shirt press. To pay the bills, I did print jobs for my friends who had recently joined the workforce. And trust me, I put in the hours. After the presses had printed their last run for the customers, I regularly worked until midnight for years in my little one-man shop in West Oakland, with the door open and the gate locked, bumping E40, Spice One, or maybe a little Sublime, breathing in toxic ink fumes, power washing my customers' designs out of screens to make way for my own stuff. But, you know, don't feel sad for me, but my dreams never materialized. I mean, the daytime work paid off. We built a growing business. We got to half a million in sales. We hired employees. We moved to a bigger space because people are always willing to pay for good work done cheap. But my own creative products, all that after hours, blood, sweat, and tears, I could never get those off the shelf. So when we say working artist, the people in this show have built a brand based on their own creative work. They might freelance, but the customers are paying for their style, their name. If they own a small business, the products they sell have their brand on it. So this is my question. And if you're listening, maybe it's your question too. How do you build an authentic personal brand from scratch that can blow up? You know, as an artist, you gotta invest a lot, man. Because maybe I die and then what? Things are worth more money? Who cares? It doesn't matter to me. It's like, what's the difference between 150 million and 250 million? I have definitely experienced bouts of potent insecurity. The feedback that I got was, oh, it's really great, but there's no market for Asians. I mean, I really mean it when it's small business day. Like, it means a lot more to me, I think, than someone who hasn't experienced what I did. Chapter one, Kim Weller. I don't make art for money. And that makes me happy. So we're going to make our way shortly towards artists with tightly defined brands, artists with companies and products, overseas manufacturing and distribution channels. But we need to start with the fine art world, where billionaire connections and a favorable write-up in the New York Times make the difference between a piece selling for 10 million bucks or winding up in the trash heap. Lots of us believe the difference is a lucky break, but I'm here to argue the difference is internal. Our mindset as creators, our motivations and intentions. I've never made work with the thought of even selling it. Even if I've spent a lot of money on supplies, I don't care. I feel like the supplies are like what I spend on food. So in order for us to really get the difference between creativity and building a brand, we need to start here with the purity of the form, with a woman who needs to do art the same way she needs to eat or breathe and has never paid a dime. Hi, Ruben. <laughs> Hi, Kim. Can you just describe where we are right now? Oh, where we are? Physically? Yeah. Or mentally? Like Ooh. when you look around, like, you know. Yeah, we're in my, my little studio on the fourth floor, and we're in Koreatown. And I live by myself. I did have two kitties when I came down, and one died in November, so it's just the two of us. And 
I just have a little tiny bed and you're sitting in one of my one of two of my chairs and I feel really comfortable here and I do a lot of art. Kim has close cropped gray hair, bright lipstick, and is wearing a plastic gold chain around her neck with a big dollar sign at the end of it. Like the kind you might find in the Halloween section of Walgreens. How would you describe your art? Um, <laughs> let's see. I always try to think of like, if I walked into that park by the fountains, like what would I be like generally surprised to see? Floating vulture, floating uh, portrait of Michael Jackson, the white plastic chain around him, propped up on styrofoam. I get a lot of styrofoam white limousine on a hatchet floating around. I ended up not bringing the hatchet. All different types of materials. Bubble wrap, you know, cardboard. And I want, like, when someone looks at it to be, I don't know, like, not, not, sh- I don't know what I'm trying to say right now. And plus, I hate talking about my work. <laughs> she hates talking about her work. I can relate. This kind of sweet, self-deprecating comment points towards a lack of ego, right? Or maybe it's an insecurity. But I've seen her installations and they're incredible. She paints what frightens her, art as therapy. She uses a lot of styrofoam because it represents the extinction of the world. I know everyone has walked into a modern art gallery and seen work equally bizarre and complex and sometimes expensive. Kim works as a docent at a huge fine arts museum in L.A. She gets paid an hourly wage to stand around and talk to strangers about the art. You know, like, those people come in and go, where are the the Basquiat's? We want to see, do they own the one that went for, you know, and they're just, like, talking about uh, the money aspect of it and not, like, the actual work or the artist. Mm. Because it's like, it doesn't matter to me. It's like, what's the difference between 150 million and 250 million? Yeah. I just have to like most time remove myself and I tell myself I'm working there because I'm paying my rent so I can do my artwork. Kim's work has been avant-garde since the 1970s when she first began having shows. Fast forward 15 or 20 years, she went back to art school and got her master's, really just for the knowledge. I've never made work with the thought of even selling it. Even if I've spent a lot of money on supplies, I don't care. I feel like the supplies are like what I spend on food. But the idea that someone would devote their life to something and not try to make money off of it is foreign to most people, even her brother. Like every time I have an art show and I'll tell him, he goes, well, you're going to sell it? (laughs) I'm like, I don't know. I haven't even thought about it. And he's like, well, you know, you should be making some money from your art. And, And I tried to explain, but it's like talking to a cement wall. So it made me wonder if Kim ever applies her framework to the rest of the art world. Like, does she consider other people a sellout if they make work just based on what they know will be successful with critics or galleries or the commercial world? I can't really say I consider that a sellout because every artist is different. You know, it's just like every writer, every film director, every actor, you know, they... We all have, like, different ideas of what success is. Kim Weller. You can find her latest renegade installations on Instagram, at L.A. Creeps. You've probably heard the phrase that building a successful brand is a war of attrition. Basically, whoever has the discipline and resources to stay in the game will ultimately win. But as we learned from Kim, it's not just a matter of time. Ambition is a key element in getting your work out to the masses. It's a fight, you know, and so I know what I want, 
And yeah, f- trying to find funding for that at times has been a real problem. Chapter two, mere one. It's too much ego. I grew up in the 90s in San Francisco doing graffiti like a lot of other kids in the inner city schools I went to. Tagging on buses and freeways, stealing spray paint from hardware stores to do pieces in abandoned warehouses. Nobody had heard of Banksy, but Mir was already a legend. And when I was 12 years old, I used my chore money to buy one of his prints off the internet and hang it on my bedroom wall. Let's just start with that image that I bought when I was a kid. And like, what did that mean to you at the time that you painted it? Yeah, that was called uh, How the West Was Lost. It had um, Chinese and black slaves carrying a paved road on their back with Harley Davidsons and Dukes of Hazard yahoos riding down it and women being chained to their husbands and just really extremely comedic type of fantasy of mine that it would be a scholastic book cover one day for American history you know, kind of pulling the veil back and getting a different perspective on normality, I guess. Yeah. Which isn't very normal at all. Yeah. (laughs) I want to focus on this tension between being a politically woke person and having to grind out a living. I have to make my money by being more picky and choosy. Mm. And, And there's less opportunities for me. And um, it's a personal choice I made because I'm so, I believe in my work so much and I believe in what I'm pursuing so much that I just couldn't stomach doing anything else. I really couldn't, and I don't care how much someone wanna pay me. Yeah. Like, I, I'm doing great, you know? All of us have to figure out this balance for ourselves, what makes sense for us, and for the morals of the community that we choose to be a part of. So to understand Mir's personal equilibrium between survival and selling out, I think we need to go back to the roots, where he came up. Today, some street artists are sort of independent, more like a traditional artist with solo shows and whatnot. But back in the day, every graffiti writer was a member of a crew, kind of a graffiti gang. And just like any other gang, Most of the time, these crews basically consisted of kids who grew up in the same neighborhood. And that's exactly how Mir became a member of a world-famous crew from the gritty streets of Hollywood, CBS, or Can't Be Stopped. Skate One, the leader of CBS, he was a kind of a heroic figure in my neighborhood. He was this gigantic dude riding a skateboard with a mohawk tagging on everything. And as a little boy, I was scared of him. Eventually, I approached him and wanted to get in CBS crew. And uh, and he's like, well, let's, I'll meet you at Taco Bell this afternoon, bring your books. He's not talking about school books. Skate wanted Mir to bring his black books filled with his graffiti art. And uh, he, you know, he acted like this was normal. And when we were done, he started cracking up. He's like, dude, you're in the crew, man. You're the shit. And he's like, actually, I've never done this with anyone before. And I start cracking up and he started laughing because it was like, I, I guess we both took it really serious that I was getting in his crew. Yeah. And um, yeah, man, that was my big brother. And, uh, you know, he, he died in 1993. He got hit by a train in Amtrak. The, the late 80s and early 90s of LA was just like, it was so full of crime and fun and danger, it captivated you and you're like addicted to it. Riding on the outside of buses from Westwood to downtown LA, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, getting thrown off and getting back on another one, just riding on the outside, tagging on everything, just being like, just total hoodlum vandals and and, and seeing purpose in it, too. And did you hold down um, jobs during any of these periods of your life? And how did you begin to build an income as an artist? Yeah. You know? Well, it was really a trip, man. You know, I, I had a... I was a, Being a graffiti writer in L.A. meant in the 90s that there was gang life, too, that affected you and got involved, whether you wanted it or not. And my crew had beef with some crews on the west side. 
and I was going, to, I got kicked out of Fairfax, so I had to go all the way out to West LA, and I'm in school with like our arch rivals and so my friend got his jaw broken with a baseball bat and I had guns getting pulled on me so I, I dropped out of high school and immediately started painting shops on Melrose built and designed 14 stores on Melrose mm. yeah I mean that became my profession at the time graffiti was exploding and so instead of being victims of vandalism hip record stores and cafes and clothing shops hired Mir to basically do graffiti-style interior and exterior decoration. Through this work, he started learning from contractors how to build. And this being Hollywood, of course, it wasn't long before Mir graduated from designing stores to designing sets for big-time movies. I worked on, like, Batman. I worked on Terminator 2. I worked on all kinds of TV commercials, really interesting stuff, very artsy commercials, you know, Toyota commercials of giant steel balls swinging with cars dodging them and stuff like that. I think this is interesting. He'll do commercial work that he deems to be artistic. Maybe this is where Mir draws the line. Or maybe his values have just shifted over time. I mean, to be fair, it's been two decades since he worked on those Toyota commercials. I think a lot of us can relate to moral battles over money. But for Mir, it's a big part of his brand that he's a strident anti-capitalist. Like, on his website, there's a print called American Revolution with kind of a violent Occupy Wall Street scene. When you buy the print, it comes with a 56-page essay he wrote titled, and I better say this slowly, The War on Art, excerpts from a theoretical approach to interpreting creative freedom in capitalism. If you missed that, don't worry. He'll say it again in a second. But here's the thing. Each of those prints goes for 350 bucks a pop, which is not an insignificant amount. You know, you're forced to be, or we're all forced to be capitalists inside yeah. a society that we may or may not approve of. And totally. how do you deal with that question personally? <laughs> a theoretical approach to interpreting creative freedom within capitalism. <laughs> yeah, um, while paying the rent. Yeah, while paying the rent and having a good time. <laughs> or a bad one. I have actually learned how to not have joy in the process, but just fucking grin and bear it and deal with it. You know, it's a fight. I refuse to sell out. I've had my sell out moments in life. They're not big, but you know, I, I, there's nothing I'm embarrassed of. At the same time, there's, there's some things I'm just like, ah, whatever, man. It was just money. That's all it was. Like Limp Biscuit album cover, you know? Cool, whatever. Not, not my cup of tea, but you know. It's, you know, as an artist, you got to invest a lot, man. You got to invest a lot. And I, I hate ideas like pay to play, but you, you do in some sense. You got to participate in the mix, you know, if you want your shit to, to, to blast out there to everyone. It's like, wow, this person got 50,000 likes. How'd they do that? And it's like, no, nah, they didn't get 50,000 likes. They paid to play, you know? <laughs> so it's, um, I don't even know what to say about it. It's just a very strange time right now. It's, it's, we're living in those interesting times that they warned us about. Pay to play. What a concept. There are so many of these weird ass decisions we have to make when we're building our own brand. Like, should I pay some dude in India to bump up my Instagram followers? Or how about, should I give the radio station DJ a kickback if he plays my song during the mix? It makes it very murky to define where the line is between true success and paid promotion. I just, I can't play too much of the game. And so I'm just grateful that, that people are digging what I'm doing. I have become the business, finally, I guess. But it's the business of 
<laughs> no business. <laughs> it's, it's really not about the business, it's about the art. And so luckily there are people out there that love real art still. So Mir has found his equilibrium and he's found his tribe. So who are these fans? And what's his relationship with them? After 9-11, finally everyone woke up, I'd say around Occupy, right? And uh, since then, it's like my fans have increased incredibly. And I mean, these are real fans. These are people that love me and I, I love running into them now. Let me break in because I think it's here in his relationship to his fans where you can begin to see how Mir deals with fame. Well, at first, of course, he was graffiti famous and everyone in the graffiti world knows who he is. But here's the thing, focusing on his social message allows him to deflect heat from the spotlight of his reputation. And it's really positive because like, I'm not talking about me. They're, sometimes they talk a little bit about them or me or whatever, but we're, we're together, we're talking about it. Like, what's going on? So the way I think about building a brand, or really building a name for yourself of any type, is like you're developing your work in the safety of the shadows. And when you're ready to get up out of the shadows, you gotta be comfortable standing in the spotlight. And there's a lot of ego in that. I mean, everyone has a place where they rise to or fall to in their themselves, but uh, I, I guess I don't really like to focus on that. It's too much ego. And I noticed that a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people are striving to just promote themselves. And that's kind of weird. And I noticed, you know, the ego trip is what drives the demand for the money, you know? And, and so there's a, there's, a, there's a balance in there that I'm trying to find, and I've always been conflicted by that. The balance between being hungry and humble, between ambition and ego. When your ambition drives you into the spotlight, keeping your ego in check is tough because the job of the ego is to protect our self-esteem. I love this Quincy Jones quote, you need confidence, but an ego usually is just an overdressed insecurity. But hey, that's easy for me to say, I'm not the one fending off international graffiti groupies because no matter how much they talk about politics, his authenticity is a huge part of his fans' attraction to him. In a way, he's never just selling his artwork. He's selling the legend of Mir, a CBS crew, LA veteran graffiti writer. I guess law of nature, you know? You're the dog that pees on the most trees. All the dogs want to know who's peeing on the trees. <laughs> yeah, you know? keep putting those stickers up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mir one, LA king and art legend. Visit his website at mereone.com, M-E-A-R-O-N-E. -E. Unfortunately, he's no longer selling that print I bought in the eighth grade, but he does have the new one I got. It's called Exploring Earlier Futures, and it's sitting pretty on my wall right here. Okay, so we've talked about the difference between ambition and ego. Letting go of that little glass cage where you're protecting your ideas and standing up into the spotlight for public debate. But in that process, how do you find your people? The ones who will get what you're doing, understand your vision, and support it. On the next show, we talk to two down-to-earth folks who've started big-ass businesses by finding their niche and hitting it hard. You know, if I can get 20, 30,000 more people interested in our scene, then yeah. Friends and family, much love. We'll see you next time here on Working Sunday. Music and mixing by William Mandel with major editing support 
by David Fox, Emily Shaw, and Eric Silver. Amanda McLaughlin and Multitude Productions help us get our marketing hustle on. Working Sunday is produced by me, Ruben Lee. Recorded in Los Angeles and right here in Oakland, California. Have you ever ran across an arch rival crew in later life? Oh, yeah. And we're all good now. It's hilarious. I mean, hugs, hand slaps, you know, hanging out. It's all good. Um, I bump into heads that uh, have beat me up, (laughs) destroyed my art. Uh, I bump into people that I haven't been too fair to, and I apologize, and we become friends. (laughs) But, I mean, I love humanity, man. Hey, buddy. Thanks for listening. Appreciate you. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button in your podcast app. That way you'll know when the next season of Working Sunday hits the stream. But for now, of course, just kick back, relax, and enjoy the rest of the shows.